good mug. Do you see this? You see that? Uh, can, you see? can you guys see that right there? This is a good mug. My, uh, my manager got me this mug for Christmas. And I'm kind of a mug guy, a little bit. Uh, this is a Yeti. I've never had, I say I'm a mug guy, but I've never had a Yeti. This mug is really good. It keeps my coffee hot for like a really long time. Anyway, I am Jay Moss. Uh, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk about mastering from stems. What is a stem master? What are stems? If you don't know, we'll quickly go through that. I'm going to show you a bunch of cool stuff. Mastering from stems is cool because I can do way more, fix way more problems, but we don't got to get in the weeds with like, oh, uh, are we going to add an eighth note delay here? Or do you want like distortion on the vocals there? It's not that. It's sort of like normal mastering where we're sort of correcting general problems in the mix, you know, once everything's already combined. But this is sort of like in between, right? You've got like mixing, 100 tracks, whatever it is. You got mastering, it's like boop, one track. Stem mastering is more like, I got like 10-ish stereo tracks and I can look at each one of those and I can put a master together. It's actually super cool. It's actually super handy. I actually kind of wish that more bands would work with me in this way. I get a lot more control. I can fix a lot more problems. I really think I can get you a better product. That's not to say that conventional mastering doesn't work great, particularly when the mix is awesome, whatever. This is cool. Let's check it out. Lots of cool tricks. Let's do it. Okay, first things first, I kind of want to just show you the layout of my session. We've got eight tracks here, as you can see by our markers. Uh, here are the song names. Here are the order in which I mastered them. And then you can see there are these bricks here, these colorful bricks. And what these represent are all the tracks for every song. I put them in folders, pop, expand down my folder, pop. All right, let's see what we got. We got drums. We have drums where I did a really cool trick. I'm excited to show you. We've got some bass guitar. We've got some guitars. We've got some lead. What is that lead? We got some lead vocal. Uh, we got some backing vocal. We got strings. We got auxiliary percussion and we got synth. Uh, what else? Oh, and we got keys. What I basically did for every song in terms of routing and organization was I would take all the tracks for that song. I put them in a folder. I would route all of those tracks to a group bus. Boom. That's here. I do all my corrections right here on the group bus. So each master is actually contained in each group bus. Subsequently, boom, I've got, what is it? Eight songs, so I've got eight group channels. You can call this a group aux, whatever you want. Each one of these, we can color these right now. Let's color these. So each one of these blue tracks now is a master. As you can see on my stereo bus, nothing. So I know it's crazy, right? I'm doing eight masters, individual masters, all in one session. That's the power of modern day computing. I don't like making separate sessions. Uh, it's way easier to export. It's way better for my workflow. I've done videos sort of on that before. I could do it again. But yes, I have eight different masters in one session. That's how I organize them. Tracks come in, they go to the group bus. That group bus gets the full mastering treatment along with all the different stuff I do to all the individual tracks. And then boom, move on to the next one. Boom, move on to the next one. Follow it down for all of it. Obviously, if I had like hundred songs, probably my CPU would freak out and I wouldn't be able to do this. But fortunately for uh, where we are with computers today, I can manage eight pretty easily. So now I'm just gonna walk you through each of the things I did individually. So we're gonna treat each individual track. Those tracks are gonna get sent to a song bus basically where all the stems go. And then there'll be an overall treatment once we finish all of our individual corrections. Boom, one master done. So we're just gonna work on one song today because I don't have time to do you know, all of them with you guys. It'd be a very long video. Okay, uh, no place to start like the drums. I'll take, I'll bypass everything that's on the drums and let's just listen to them as is. Okay, so what do I like right away? Uh, the roomy, they sound awesome. The thing I'm hearing is that the hi-hats are kind of bright and kind of loud. And I kind of wish I had some more transient response. That just means like kick and snare, punching through a little bit more. Uh, obviously because we're doing mastering and we're in stems, we can't just you know add more kick and snare. That would have to be done in mixing, but I can do a couple cool tricks. First, let's treat the hi-hat. Uh, so to treat the hi-hat, we're gonna focus on upper mid-range frequencies and like really high frequencies too. We're gonna use Soothe and then we're gonna use Fab Filter with some dynamic uh, frequency cutting. Check it. <laughs> 
All right, first up, Soothe. So as you can see, I'm not doing a ton. Uh, when the cymbals come in, you'll see a bit of a cut here in the high mids. And when the hi-hats play, or kind of all the time, but also when the hi-hats play, you're gonna see a little attenuation here. This is negative three dB. So I'm doing negative one dB at most. Like it's not a lot. Cool, that's making a subtle but important difference. Okay, now on to fab filter. Um, so I'm doing a general cut here. I wanna show you how I kind of find where I decide to low pass. This is just a pet peeve of mine. Fab filter calls low passing high cutting. And actually when I first started recording, high cutting of course makes more sense. Low pass is sort of like counterintuitive, but high cut and low pass are interchangeable words uh, just in case something I say doesn't match. It's annoying, but now you know. So essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shift this low pass around until I feel like I'm just taking off the top enough but not overly, overly darkening. And we can do that by using this little headphone icon. So I settled around 10 or 11K-ish here. That sounds good to me. And then you'll notice this one is dynamic. This is sort of mirroring what we did in Soothe. We're taking some high mids out and we're just softening the top here on these hats. What's funny is that some of the frequencies lower than that are actually kind of like more annoying, but those frequencies to me were getting to be a little fatiguing. They just had more amplitude. So that's why I'm correcting, even though like somewhere around like 2K, if you just solo it is like to me more piercing to the ear, but that 4K area, there was a surplus there. I wanted to sort of balance that out. The other thing that I talked about is that I want to add some more impact to the kick and the snare. And that's not the easiest thing to do right now because we don't have a kick track. We don't have a snare track but because the kick and the snare are sort of the loudest things, I'm gonna use an expander instead of a compressor on these drums, and I'm going to sort of creatively expand out the kick and the snare, and then I'm gonna tuck it up under the original drums. This is gonna kind of dry up the hi-hats, which is also beneficial. It's gonna sort of fundamentally take our cymbals down and give more impact to our transients. Now, I'm sure when they are mixing, it sounded really good, but as we apply limiting and we move towards the mastering stage, and all of our transients are trying to poke out of the mix and we're slamming them down with a limiter, uh, that ratio can get kind of messed up. So as I was getting closer to a louder volume, I realized I was like, oh man, like I need more kick and snare. This was a creative way to do that. I was very proud of myself. It's not that hard, but I'll show you. Okay, so as you can see, I've just basically made a duplicate here, but I've treated it kind of differently. The first thing up is we have our EQ. It's the same EQ in the same spot. Oops, <laughs> close to the same spot as the one before. But this guy right here, he's gonna do all the work. I'll keep it on, then I'll turn it off and then I'll put it back on. Uh, watch how much drier this gets using the expander. So it's almost working like a gate, uh, which is cool. You could probably kind of use a gate for this too. I decided to use an expander. I thought it sounded cool. I'm really only looking for sort of like the beef and the power out of this particularly supplemental track. So the last thing I want to do is exacerbate those higher frequencies, which I was cutting in the first place. So I'll show you, I did like another little low pass filter, tuck it up under, and you're going to feel the kick and the snare come way more forward. Okay. And this is my secondary supplemental. Um, I'll turn everything off real quick and then put it on one last time. Okay, that kind of sounds ridiculous on its own, but check me, let's put them together. Here's with the supplemental, I'll take the supplemental away, I'll put it back in and you'll be like, wow, that's so much better. I can't wait to do that in my mix. And if we really want to be cool guys, we can check it out in the full mix, which we'll do now.
How much more pronounced is that in the full mix? I know like when we did the side by side, where it was like, okay, yeah, I feel some more kick and snare, but then when it has to fight through all the synths and like all the layers, that extra kick and snare, even though that track kind of sounds weird on its own, it doesn't sound weird at all in the mix. And when you take it away, you're like, oh, where'd my impact go? So try it out in your mix. It's a neat trick if you're ever in this situation. Again, if you're in a normal mix, you could just raise a kick and snare, but we weren't, so this is what we did. Okay, so next up is bass. I liked the bass guitar a lot. I just thought it was kind of like pick attack heavy. I'm gonna show you how I combated that, and I added some secret distortion I didn't tell the band about, but you already proved the masters, so you must like it. All right, so let's listen to the bass here on its own. Cool, let's check another passage. I think the bass sounds good, it's tracked well. I kind of like that plunkiness of it, but given sort of the darker nature of this song, I kind of wanted to darken the bass up, and I did that by, yet again, dynamically attenuating some frequencies. Uh, let's check it out. Okay, so this is our EQ for the bass guitar. Uh, what you're gonna see is I have a dynamic bell here, and I have a low pass filter here. When I was working on this, I started with the bell first. So let's turn off the low pass filter, and let's turn off the bell and just look at the signal. See that little noise is about there. So I wanted to encapsulate all of sort of the fret noise that's sort of in here. Let's listen to it. Cool, so that's dynamically going to attenuate with uh, the performance, which you know I love. Boom. And then like I did on the drums, I just slid this down until it felt right. So let's turn this on. We ended up about 700 hertz, so let's back it off. I think that sounds really cool. Like you can still hear the pick attack, but it's not as like piercy. Um, it's not like a life-changing difference, but for me, one that is big enough to make. And then I added some sneaky distortion, which we're gonna look at right now. Okay, so this once again is the bass without my friend Devil Lock here. And we're gonna just turn this on. You can see I didn't do a lot. Um, this thing can get really extreme. I will show you that, uh, but my settings really were conservative. It's cool, like it's more dynamically contained. It's got that cool fuzz on it. I think with the synth in this song, which is also fuzzy, they play really well together and they sort of fuzz in different frequency ranges, which makes the fuzz aspect, I don't know why that's in quotes, uh, sort of more three dimensional. But since we have it open, let's uh, turn these knobs and just see what this plugin can do while we have a second. Cool, it turns it into a synth. Uh, you know what, just for fun, let's hear that in the mix. Yeah, it's terrible, it's ridiculous. All right, let's put it back. <laughs> uh, as a round one. I've already sent the masters off, they're approved. I don't have to be perfect anymore. All right, and let's check out uh, without this stuff on the bass. Just listen for the pokiness. Like it's not bad by any means at all. It's already like reasonably well compressed. Um, I just think it's a little bit more exciting with this on. Okay, let's move on. Uh, drums done, bass done, let's move on to guitars. Wow. Okay, so let's hear the guitars in the mix and then we'll pull them up, we'll do the thing. All right, that's them treated. Let's turn everything off and take a listen to these guys. I don't know for sure, but these guitars kind of sound to me like they used amp sims. Either way, we've got to kind of warm them up. Okay, so first move again, soothe. So this is gonna represent our high mid range reduction. Uh, let's check it out. As you can see, there's not a lot of information up here. So for that reason, I'm just sort of focusing down here. Um, a couple plugins from now, I'm gonna be shaving some stuff that's up here. That's more just for safety, but the big focus here is the high mid range. Okay, that already sounds warmer and better to me. 
This one is a weird one. I posted this on my Instagram. It's a really weird plugin. It does a bunch of stuff. I only really like one of the things it does. It can shred, it can spread. It's the shred spread, but I like the uh, shred. <laughs> the spread is just a stereo widener. I don't typically need it. The shred, <laughs> I hate that it's called shred. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the shred knob is gonna warm up our lower mids. As ridiculous as that knob is, as weird as this plugin is, uh, it's kind of good. It's particularly good for this. Okay, with, without, with, let's get warm. Do you hear how all that brittle and all that annoying is being balanced out by adding shred <laughs> to the guitars, which is really just like rounding off some highs and it's it's warming it up in general. Uh, with plugins like this, we don't actually know what it's doing. We just have to use our ears. This comes from me being around forever, a ton of experience in remembering like, oh yeah, what about that old plugin? And here we are. Okay, and as I mentioned before, um, I'm just doing this stuff. This isn't a big deal. This is just for safety. Like we don't really need any guitar information that's up here. We don't really need any guitar information that's down here. These are really safe areas. I mean, if you're gonna high pass at like 76, that's fine. And low pass at like nine, nine, 10, whatever, that's typically fine too. I mean, there's gonna be cases where maybe that's not the case, but often this is fine. You can see right away when I play, there's like next to nothing down here. So this is kind of like a safety. Okay, let's turn everything off. We'll turn it all back on. Okay, and then just one more time, we'll hear it in the mix. Sounds awesome. Uh, let's move on to vocals. So looking at these vocals, this is gonna be kind of a good thing that I talked about at the beginning of the video. Like, there's gonna be all this compression and all this delay and stuff baked into the vocal because that was appropriate. That was the mixing engineer's job. Now, as someone who's mastering from the stems, I'm just gonna do general corrections that benefit the overall mix. Um, but like when I play these, you're gonna hear all kinds of stuff baked in. We're just gonna work on top of that. Okay, let's listen to the vocals in the mix. We'll solo them and then I'll show you what corrections I made. Let's solo that. And everything is here. Everything is okay, like I said, a lot of effects. Uh, the things that I'm hearing that we should be correcting, I hear some rumble, like some real low rumble that should be easy to take out. They're kind of sibilant. We'll probably use a de-esser. Um, and then I think that they sound just a little bit husky. I want to find the spots where the resonant frequencies in the lower part of his voice that are kind of like muffly sounding. I want to dynamically attenuate those. And then I want to boost like the higher mid range where the diction of the voice is. For those of you who don't know, the high mid range, particularly like 3K or something, is where the ear starts hearing things first. So that's where speech is really focused. They think it's like an adaptive thing evolutionarily, which makes a lot of sense. So when we want to add more diction to the vocal, we look around 3K. This, by the way, is super super easy to overdo. I might adjust, but it's gonna be in that area. Step one, uh, some de -esser. Just listen for S sounds. You'll see a little bit of reduction here. This isn't the end of the world. It's just nice to have. It's a little bit of balance. And everything is here. Everything is cool, he says the letter S, boom, we de -ess. Okay, and this is my EQ for what I said I was gonna do. This is taking out rumble. Let's listen. That's stuff we don't need. These two points are gonna grab the lower mid-range huskier elements and dynamically attenuate. So when he sings higher notes, these aren't gonna attenuate quite as much, but it's gonna help balance. And then like I said, this is actually at 2K, but somewhere two, to 5K, somewhere in there is where the diction of the vocal is. I have a little 2K boost here. This is to help elevate it above those guitars and hopefully make the words in the lower passages more discernible. Oh, and then this is just warming slightly. Let's listen to what's up there. It's just sort of staticky stuff that I didn't think we really need. And again, given sort of the context of this mix being kind of like having a darker vibe with that gritty synth and stuff, uh, I just didn't want a lot of that stuff up there tickling the ears.
Okay, let's uh, hear it. And everything is stored here. Everything is choked down. We're a bastard eye version of ourselves. Cool, so as advertised, uh, we did all the things we said we were gonna do. Moving on. Okay, that was main vocals. We're gonna do backing vocals now. There's not a lot to it. I know it's getting kind of tedious. The video is taking forever, but we're getting there. Uh, I literally was just some EQ and some reverb, so this will be. Bah, 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 bah. Okay, here are our backing vocals. Typical story. I don't like all this weird, super harsh high stuff. I'll probably add that in the master. This is to balance it out so I get more headroom when I need it down the line in the high frequency area. Uh, and you can see what I did here. And headphones. So I'm just taking out super high stuff. Those are supposed to sit behind the main vocals anyway. And then I used uh, Lex Room, the Lexicon Reverb Pack. I really like it. Just a little wet, dry. I again, the mix is kind of done, so I'm just adding a little bit of vibe. Not a lot to it. Versus. Not bad, right? It's got a little bit more dimension. Yay, backing vocals done. Let's quickly move on to strings. The strings sounded pretty good on their own. So let's pull this guy up. Let's make him bigger. Hello. Um, just a little bit of sub roll off, but I mean really low. I mean, that's 33 hertz, right? So this is just damage control to buy us some headroom when we limit. I did almost nothing except uh, I added compression. That compression is here. Uh, we can check that out now. Again, that's just to control things a little bit, keep it a little bit more dynamically even. A really important part of this step is using the sidechain filter, which is built into this particular compressor, the uh, Vertigo VSC2, one of my favorite in the box compressors of all time. Enabling that sidechain filter at 90 Hertz makes the compressor pump a little less. It's focusing on all the frequencies above 90 Hertz to formulate how much compression it wants to give. So uh, I like to do that on sources where I don't want the low end to pump the hell out of the compressor. So that's what we did here. Not a lot to it. These synths, by the way, these days are so good that you aren't often, unless you're doing it for creative reasons, you don't have to correct a lot, maybe just shave a little on each end. Next up is just percussion. Basically nothing to this. Just, again, rolling off high stuff I don't like. You can't tell the trend here. It's just all about buying headroom on the ends of the spectrum, carving out certain places where I want the mid range to be more focused, like in the low mid range of the guitars, and then boosting in the high mid range in the vocals. We're just sort of shaving things, nudging things, and uh, creating articulation in the vocal. We're creating some warmth in the guitars, that type of stuff. Looking for things that might conflict and take away from the best representation of the song. Okay, here we have another synth, same story. Not doing much, just a little control up top. As you can see, it doesn't even have any information up here except for that initial hit. And I'm just taking away this type of stuff. If you can even hear that, uh, it's really high. Uh, again, this is more damage control stuff. These synths sound really good. Then lastly, we have some more synth or keys or whatever. It's, um, you know, digital sound library stuff. Uh, these keys were mixed really well on their own. I like the vibe, they fit the song really well. So I just added a touch more reverb. This is short reverb. It just pulls the keys back a little bit and kind of, I don't know, makes them sound like they're in the same space as the rest of the song. Um, it's a subtle change, but all of these subtle changes really add up, I think. Okay, so that's it. I mean, we finished, we treated all the stems. From this point on, it's just a normal mastering process now. Uh, I might do another video on that mastering process. This has already taken me forever. So we'll see how it goes. Um, I could probably walk through that one a little quicker. So this is my stem mastering video, number one. Uh, mastering from stems is cool. Remember that. Hope you learned something. I am Jay Moss, and I'll see you in the next video that I arbitrarily release. Adios.